So our next speaker is Jim Bjork. We have the uh, distinguished pleasure of having two NIH speakers, um, one from NIDA and one from NIMH. And while um, I think Jim would agree that we haven't always agreed <laughs> in, um, in our adolescent science, that's what's so important in terms of making the science more precise and also in terms of new discoveries. So please join me in welcoming Jim to talk about individual differences in motivational circuitry. So I, again, I thank Bea for rescuing me before I uh, completely slide into bureaucratic irrelevance. Um, my, my comments to you are directed not only as a bench researcher, but as a program official at NIDA. Um, and so um, I think there are a couple important questions uh, in this research. The first of all, um, does adolescent uh, incentive motivational function show increased sensitivity or activity, especially relative to adults, whether it's just an, uh, kind of a direct two group comparison kind of deal, or whether it's biphasic, where you have kind of like one pattern in childhood, one pattern in mid-adolescence, and another pattern in young adulthood. And um, I mean, BJ referenced that when I used uh, this, this very crude incentive task, I, I didn't find it. But I'm proceeding with, with the understanding that the bulk of the literature shows that in most context tasks, in relative context, this is what you see. Um, so the other main question, I believe, is if, if so, if we get this sensitivity, does it have a public health impact, especially with regard to risky behaviors uh, or mortality or morbidity related to behavior uh, causes? And I think that's very important. Um, drug abuse, injury, violence, and so forth. So just an example of this kind of research, here's a, here's a, a very clever slot machine task. If you played a slot machine, you know if you get three in a row, you win, you get a payoff. And um, uh, a group in Europe used the task where they compared children adolescents like eight to, 11 to 12, 14, 15, 18 to 23 on what happens in the striatum, the reward hot spot, when people see that they've got two in a row lining up versus just, you know, the second one's different, you know you're not going to win. I think it's, it's kind of a, a clever task. And they show here that um, uh, you get a lot more mesolimbic activation here in this mid-adolescent time period. And, I think this sort of follows the, this, a lot of the psychosocial literature nicely, where you find increases in risk-taking and venturesomeness and so forth on psychometric instruments, and certainly in uh, anecdotal lore. Um, I was also interested in looking at how, looking at how this kind of biphasic inverted U pattern mapped onto public health. And um, here I'm a bit less sanguine. Uh, now, certainly for unintentional non-fatal injuries, you can kind of see it ticking up there around age 14 to 15. Uh, when you get to the more severe stuff, it looks as though, um, you know, if we, if, uh, you know, it looks like the, the curve is, is shifted by a few years. And there's really not as much going on in that 14 to 15 peak. If you envision that there is some uh, peak in stridal sensitivity to environmental incentives going on there, now, if you look at actual fatal injuries, I would have to say that if the brain matures around mid-20s, then brain maturation is hazardous to your health. Um, so, you know, this, this, this again um, is, is, you know, kind of a, a more protracted um, pattern here. And now, let's just back off from the most extreme cases and just look at something that kids do more often, which is binge drinking. These are the very most recent nationwide survey we have, at least in America. And again, with binge drinking is surprise, surprise, it's college age and so forth. And it actually, uh, may, is actually stays quite high for, for quite a lot of, of young adulthood. So um, I'm, I'm thinking initially that, that these, these findings of increased sensitivity, maybe especially to more social and emotional contact, more social stimuli, I think it may be a bit more relevant for certain elements of venturesome uh, or, or frantic texting their friends or whatever. But in terms of stuff that's actually killing or wrecking young people, I don't know that a mid-adolescent peakish necessarily maps onto that particularly well across all adolescents. But what I'd like to share with you is why I think uh, certain biological traits of incentive neurocircuitry in that age group can be very important but maybe not just for the typical adolescent. So 
I'm going to take a sidebar here to tell you about, compared to other fMRI tasks like working memory, finger tapping, and what have you, incentive processing, I think, is notoriously variable from subject to subject. I am immensely privileged to be the NIH science officer uh, of the Human Connectome Project, where we give a, a whole battery. This is 1,200 SIB pairs with a whole bunch of, of structural MRI, DTI, resting state, long resting, longish resting state, and several different domains of, of task processing in the scanner, a whole bunch of NIH toolbox and other measures outside the scanner, and it's all open access to all qualified investigators. Data are being released quarterly and probably soon semi-annually. Tremendous resource, but I'm, I'm taking the sidebar because uh, we published a paper recently showing what, what we got with the first 20 subjects of the 1,200. And if you look at the, uh, Mauricio Delgado's gambling task, you, you, you have to guess whether a mystery card is higher or lower than five. And this is a block design. We found it had more power, more bang for the buck when you're trying to give these, these uh, poor subjects all these different tasks. And you look at the striatum here, right? And, and it looks really good. Um, however, I find like so much of my own stuff that if, if you map the proportion of people, and this is what HCP was after, we wanted to get tasks that had brain coverage for most people so that you could do DTI from, from activations and so forth. And you see that you get 75% of the subjects having good visual responses to the gambles, but you, you just get a little tiny, just a few tiny flecks and nothing real in ventromesial striatum. So what that tells you is a lot of what's going on here is driven by a small portion of subjects, and I find that in my own data a lot. Sidebar to tell you that there's a lot of variability in this kind of research where, where you could actually try to capture that, what's driving that. And I would argue that a powerful individual difference is conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, these are arguably more so than ADHD extreme risk factors for drug abuse, and also motor vehicle accidents and so forth in, in follow-up. And conduct disorder is as it applies. It's, um, youth that have severe conduct problems, they can set fires, they can torture animals, they hit, they start fights, they use weapons in fights and so forth. Um, oppositional defiant is, is sort of a more mild version that isn't as criminal, uh, but makes life hell for parents and teachers. But what you find is um, in these large psychosocial data sets that, that track um, these, these clinical outcomes, even non-hospitalized, even community kids with conduct disorder, they actually start using alcohol and marijuana about a year and a half sooner than uh, typical kids. So, so that, that mid-adolescent peak starts to be more concentrated in these kind of kids. And if you look at their relative odds ratio at age 15, they're twice as likely to use to smoke and drink, um, almost three times as likely to use marijuana, and, and tremendously more likely to use harder drugs at the same age. Okay, so this is a real intensely interesting group. And I'm grateful to uh, Levent Kirishi here at Pittsburgh, who very kindly made me this slide two days ago from the Pittsburgh Longitudinal Data Set. I'm saying, you know, what is the survival, right, of, of, of kids to, to stay away from drinking problems? And if you look at that mid-adolescent peak, for kids with histories of conduct disorder, only half of them have not had an alcohol-related problem, an accident, a fall, uh, maybe some consequence at school or whatever. But the typical kid, I mean, they're, they're by, by that mid-adolescent peak, most of them really haven't had a problem yet, at least in, in this, what I think is a very high quality, long-standing data set. And so, you know, you look at these kind of kids in, in, in the laboratory um, and how they behave on various kinds of incentive tasks. And I would argue that they do show increased responsiveness to rewards. So if you take the Iowa gambling test where you pick cards and you have a chance of winning losing every deck you pick from, finer grain analyses of what's guiding people's choices in that show that people with these kind of histories and people who use drugs tend to have a pattern where the, the experience of a rewarded card tends to bias their behavior uh, more than other people. And in uh, more simpler tasks for younger kids, kids that have these issues are more likely to perseverate in an option that is rewarded, once you change the contingency to starting getting punished, these kinds of kids are more likely to keep going after the reward-linked option even after the, the contingencies flip. And uh, in delay discounting, um, I actually worked with conduct disorder kids in a psych ward and we had a more experiential dis discounting task where they could wait a small amount of time for a small reward or wait a larger amount of time for a larger reward. And the conduct disorder kids 
just wanted reward, uh, both in a free op, uh, free operant version and in, in more of a discrete choice version. And the kids who initiated physical fights a lot were especially more severe in this behavior. Something about immediate reward now, now, now. And um, so I was interested in, in would adolescents with actual histories of conduct disorder show more exaggerated response to rewards. And so this is the monetary incentive delay task. It's probably the, the most widely used human uh, incentive task in, in human neuroimaging. And it was developed at my old lab at NIAAA. And really briefly, um, it was ripped right out of Wolfram Schultz's preclinical single unit monkey literature where uh, the subject sees a, a graphical cue, they wait some delay, then um, they see a white square target for a fraction of a second. There's no discriminability really here. They just have to respond in a split second to see if they got a reward. And they would either win reward if they were fast enough, uh, or they would avoid losing off their running total if they were fast enough, or we would tell them just try to respond normally. And so over the course of several years, I managed to recruit several kids um, or, or find them in screening that actually met criteria for CD or ODD, um, and, they didn't, and, and they weren't taking any meds, any medications which are frequently used in these kids to manage them. Um, one one uh, girl I found because I heard her dad on the commuter bus commiserating with a colleague that she stole a car the other day, so I gave him my card <laughs> uh, and got her into the lab. So, um, so I compared kids with and without conduct disorder to see if they would have more activation to, uh, to rewards. And what I found was that yes, indeed, the teenagers with externalizing disorder had a much more robust response to being notified that they hit that target and won money versus not winning money. And so um, that was, that was uh, statistically significant and very interesting. But the other thing I'm interested in too is, is kind of the endophenotype of all this. So Ken Kendler at VCU has done landmark research with a huge cohort of twins to look at the genetic structure of these kinds of disorders and how he finds it shakes out is that what accounts for the, the comorbidity data best is if there's a latent externalizing genetic factor, not necessarily a gene, but just a genetic factor that underlies the joint risk for alcohol dependence, other drug dependence, adult antisocial behavior, and conduct disorder. So if this were true, would I also, for example, find this, this, this exaggerated mesolimbic response to gains in adult alcoholics? So uh, I designed a task for alcoholics, uh, a version of the mid task where um, you have a typical cue, you gotta respond fast, you get your reward. And, and, and as with Adriana, um, we do actually pay them cash. We show them an envelope stuffed with cash in the control room. I had to watch that envelope around the car thief girl. Um, but you know, we, we had a thing of cash in, in the storage room. Now, the other thing is, um, this is just an aside, but I noticed when I was testing alcoholics, um, and just behaviorally, I used a kind of a version of the BART test, that they tend to bitch and moan a lot, and like especially if they think that they, they were deprived of something that, that, that was theirs, like they busted on kind of the balloonish, bursting kind of deal. And so I, ver I did a version of the uh, mid where I messed with them, and a third of the trials, when they were expecting to get a reward, I said, again, you gotta do it again. You have to see the cue, respond to the target, and if you hit the tar second target also, then you'll finally get your money. And I found exactly the same thing I did in the conduct disorder. Um, not much, re really no reward activation in, in controls, and I wonder if it's because they're, with the again trials, they're sort of processing things more probabilistically instead of emotively. But the substance of pen and patients, which are really alcoholics, uh, had this huge mesolimbic uh, response to reward. They had a greater um, insula response to um, uh, notify that you losses. For those of you who don't know, insula, it's sort of the emotional instantiation of negative somatic states, like the, the sinking feeling in your gut when you see the squad cars flashing right behind you. Um, so, so the patients had more of that. And when I contrasted being told you have to work again, simply from being told that you missed on a single response trial. Again, there's no money transferred in, in either case, but just being told you have to work again significantly deactivated the stride of an alcoholics. And I'd like to, you know, if I were to hypothetically <clears throat> go back to the bench, um, I would be interested in following that up in terms of uh, treatment retention and motivational um, decrements in, in refractory patients. So, but the long and short of it is I found the same kind of thing, and I'm kind of wondering if this mesolimbic sensitivity to rewards that, it, that predated uh, much use was uh, maybe kind of an endophenotype or risk factor for addiction. Now, conduct disorder kids aren't pleasant to have around, but they will do what you ask them. 
for a few, a couple hours, if they, especially if they think they're getting some cash out of it. But you don't even have to um, go that far. I think there are valuable, low-hanging fruit just looking with individual differences, even among healthy-ish adolescents. And um, I found in my, with that monetary incentive delay task that, um, that thank you, that willingness to, to um, the reward anticipation, when you see the cue that you can win cash versus you won't win cash, the, among healthy teenagers, uh, that activation of the reward circuitry scaled with their endorsement of these kind of risk-taking behaviors. And this is, again, in normal kids, this is Zuckerman's brief sensation-seeking scale. And I found that rather um, similar to um, Adriana's own paper using her um, um, pirate icon test, where uh, in all these groups, you see the same thing in, the light, in a questionnaire that taps, do you, do you think that you would engage in these risky behaviors? you get that same individual difference just within healthy people that, it, that could account for some of that variance. Now, for, with respect to more severe symptoms, the conduct disorder risk, conduct disorder symptoms, um, it's actually a graded response in terms of if you look at the risk for, for having a substance use disorder in mid to late adolescence, there's like a dose effect of conduct problems from seven to nine in terms of the percentage likelihood of alcohol abuse or dependence at age 15. So what, would it, what if you looked at problem symptoms as a dimension? And I found the same kind of trend using Ralph Tarter, uh, also here at Pittsburgh, his drug use screening inventory. And um, I found that the total problem density uh, tended to correlate with um, mesolimbic responses to prospective rewards, both as a, con as a contrast and also, again, here's that reward versus loss dependence, that valence bias we were just talking about. Um, but also in a PPI analysis that looks at uh, a measure of connectivity-ish between the accumbens, the ventral stratum, and other mesolimbic structures, the strength of that correlation as the subject saw that they could win reward versus not, the actual connection with accumbens and these other mesolimbic structures um, like the contralateral uh, stratum, um, the uh, ACC, and the insula, itself correlated with problem symptomatology. So the kids that were already getting into trouble seemed to have a more rust, robust, coherent um, reward network-ish activation. So at the risk of being voted off of Developmental Island, um, <laughs> I, I think that the, this, this neuromaturational model is a valuable heuristic, and I, I think it's a helpful, a helpful marker. But based on the epidemiology of severe health and risk problems and, and the individual differences that the epidemiological li literature suggests, I think this, this maturational functional imbalance curve exists. But I think it's more specific to kids with conduct disorder, oppositional finance. And even, there's even literature now showing that ADHD kids might be think, a year or two behind in development. And they can catch up, or well, we, we hope. So, and, and that the, this spread, this problematic spread, may not be quite as great in controls. Okay? So um, I, I think that this is a, a nice model for, for how, what might be going on in these kids. With, and these disorders, by the way, are frequently comorbid. So, um, speaking to you now as a program official, if you want to say, is there something going on in development that is public health relevant, I think it would be interesting to, to collect more across the lifespan and, not, and, and kind of not stop collecting at adult community campus controls of convenience and start collecting older adults to find out what might be going on in connectivity that makes a 42-year-old half as likely to murder someone as a 32-year-old, even though they have more money, power, guns, connections. Um, and I'm not the only NIDA program official who feels this way. I think a, a life, more lifespan perspective could be very informative. So, um, thanks. So, uh, one more thing. <laughs> so, I, 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 don't, I think this research, even, even, even the norm, normative adolescent research, is really neat um, because I think it has some values. Uh, we talked about motivating with rewards. If, if you have an ODD kid or you're trying to treat one, you know that setting up a positive contingency structure 
to try to reward and bring out positive behavior is, is, can be clinically effective. And these data, to me, show why. These kids, they not only respond to rewards, but they might respond more. And that could have clinical relevance. And also, um, finding out what is the hook for an adolescent compared to an adult in terms of what grabs their comments, what grabs their attention, how could you tailor prevention messages? That could be leverage there. Um, and also, um, and as we'll see from Jason later on, I think there's tremendous uh, work uh, value and contextual. And finally, longitudinal designs could, could help us understand which of these individual differences might actually just be maturational differences. So I thank my mentors, my former research assistants, Ashley Starr gets a gold star, Ashley gets a gold star because she's awesome, um, and Rush Limbaugh for weighing in so supportively of my research one day <laughs> this program. So thank you.